Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon. Welcome to Home Choir. Today, of course, it's a deep dive. We're going to be looking at Bach's Cantata 147, uh, otherwise known as Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. But there, of course, is so much more to the work. And I think those of you that thought you knew the piece, well, I'm going to show you that perhaps you didn't know quite as much as you did. Now, I know we've got lots of people watching, lots of people celebrating today. Uh, we've got some birthdays to sing for. It's also Susanna and Hanu's wedding anniversary. So many congratulations to you both. And uh, I do hope you enjoy I understand that Bach uh, was played at your wedding. Must be kismet. And there's actually some really fascinating information in today's talk, which I didn't realise. One of the really wonderful nuggets is that the first performance of Herz und Mund und Tat und Neben, which is the Cantata 147, was on July the 2nd, 1723. So almost exactly 300 years ago. And in fact, Bach took up his post in Leipzig. And I'm getting ahead of myself here. He took up the post in Leipzig uh, in May of 1723. So 300 years ago to the day, Bach was in the process of moving jobs and uh, and taking up what would be his, uh, his most grand, his most prestigious and his uh, most, uh, I suppose, pressurized, uh, pressurized position of his entire career. But as I said, I'm getting ahead of myself. So it's lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, let me welcome those of you watching later on, particularly if this is your first time on the channel. My name is Ben. It's my huge pleasure and privilege to run this channel. And uh, you are very, very welcome. We do all sorts of music here. We also occasionally dress up a little smarter and uh, we do music lectures and this is one of them. Now, if you are watching later, I'll put a timestamp in the video so you can jump through all of my waffle and sound checks, which I do need to do a few of, so just bear with me, everyone, and get straight to the teaching. But uh, everyone who's here live today, lovely to see you. Lovely stuff. Just in case I need the piano. Just to put a little bit of illustration in there. Now, let me check. Now, in the description, I've put a link to the music that we are playing today. It's the entire cantata. It was conducted live in the year 2000 by Nicholas Alencourt, who's an incredible Baroque practitioner. The tenor soloist is Ian Bostridge. It's a wonderful recording found right here on YouTube, and the link is in the description. Let me just check the tracks are working. I just love Bach so much. Second movement. Lovely. Oh. Nothing like a Bach obbligato. And I'll tell you what an obbligato is as well in a minute. Of course, the bass gets a dramatic sound. <laughs> obbligato violin. And the first time we hear the famous tune... And I just want you, as you're listening, just listen to the tempo, listen to the flow. That's going to be important as we go. Hilf, yes, or hilf. There's some gorgeous music. Pair of oboe di caccia. You're going to find out what an oboe di caccia is during our session. A bass aria. Does it sound a bit like the trumpet shell sound? And then the last movement, of course. And a little something recorded just for you. And something that might be familiar. There we go. So it's all working. Great stuff. Let me welcome everyone. And let me see who have we got here this afternoon. Some lovely folks. So good afternoon, Atty. Hello, Alison. Hello, Angela. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Breda. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Christine. Hello, Dave. Hello, Jill. Hello, Eileen. Hello, Emma. Hello, Fiona. Hello, Glennis. Hello, Epi. Hello, Jill. Hello, Karen. Hello, Kareth. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Kit Kat. Hello, LTB. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mike. Hello, Mo. Hello, Nicola. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Patricia. Hello, Sheila. Hello, Soraya. Hello, Susanna. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Terry. Hello, Virginia. Hello to all of you. I do hope you enjoy this afternoon. So I'm going to get started. And um, just bear in mind that we'll just have to sing for some birthdays. And I'll tell you what's coming up on the channel next week. And then the deep dive will get started. Um, just make yourselves at home, folks. Get comfy. I've got some gorgeous music to play for you. The I would estimate I'm going to aim for this to be around about 40 minutes. So if you have to leave on the half hour, that's absolutely fine. But I don't want to rush because it's Bach and no one wants to hear Bach rushed. Uh, so let me uh, let me get started. 
and uh, I'm going to click my first slide and this is to tell you what's coming up on Home Choir this week. Of course, on Friday, we've got our fun Friday session when the Red Red Robin comes bob, bob, bobbing along. Something very different to what you're going to hear today, but incredibly catchy. And just to make sure that something from Home Choir goes with you into the weekend, we're also going to have the Banana Boat song, When the Cat Came Back, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, and my song, All About Earworms. So very, very catchy tunes on Friday. Consider yourselves warned. And then on Sunday, we're going to have uh, Sibelius, Be Still My Soul, for Vivaldi uh, et in Telepax and that gorgeous Sanctus from the Foray Requiem with other music besides, so join me on Sunday if you can. Now, remember all the details for both the deep dives and our upcoming programmes you can find through our newsletter, which is free. Just go to our website, homequad.org, fill in the form, and that's it. You're done. We promise never to spam you, but if you tell us when your birthday is, just day and month. We'll sing you happy birthday. And we've got three people who will be singing for today, for Jackie, for Hanu and for Violet. As you can see, their birthdays are either today or tomorrow, so to all three of you, many happy returns. And here's our note, and we're going to sing after two. One, two. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jackie, Hanu and Violet. happy returns to all three of you. So everyone, thank you so much for joining me today for the latest in our series of Deep Dives. These are music lectures, but they are aimed at everyone. I try and make it as accessible and understandable as possible. Just kind of peek back peek behind the curtain, really, as to what's going on with some of these great works. And today, we're in the company of perhaps the greatest of all composers, the grandfather of what we think of as modern music. He was revered by so many during his life, but even more, he's become a legend since then. Johann Sebastian Bach, and in particular, his Cantata number 147, uh, which is known as Herz und Mund und Tat und Leben, which is heart and mouth and deed and life but from which we draw one of the most famous pieces in the choral repertoire, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. So this is a little excerpt, a little extract, if you will, from the score itself, painstakingly written out in Bach's meticulous hand. And it's always interesting to see how different composers write their music. Bach, of course, had to draw all of the staves, as all the composers did, and given the amount of music that he produced throughout his life, a huge amount of time was spent just painstakingly drawing the staves before he could write any notes. When we look at our piece next week, which was composed by Handel, one of the defining characteristics of Handel scores is how messy they are, and often with coffee stains on them. Bach's, however, generally are much, much tighter and much neater. And we're going to discuss this wonderful cantata, focusing mainly on uh, the movements that then became Jesus Joy, but I need to tell you a little bit more about the, the history behind it and its enduring impact, really, on the world of classical music. Now, Johann Sebastian Bach was born in 1685, same year as Handel, of course, although it's pretty, pretty clear that Handel and Bach never actually met. There are some people who think maybe they met once, and but they, although they admired each other, they never actually met. He was born in Eisenach in Germany, and he's considered one of the most influential and one of the most prolific composers in the history of Western music, with a career that spanned decades. Now, Bach is known for his complex contrapuntal style, and contrapuntal refers to the term we call counterpoint, which is the interweaving of melodic lines. It's a really difficult thing to have to do, and if you study music to any to any level, particularly if you go beyond a sort of basic musical training, you will have to study the music of Bach, because it's from his music that we derive so much of modern music. He composed music in a variety of genres, um, particularly keyboard music, orchestral music, he composed vocal music, chamber music, and of course cantatas, which is what we're talking about today. And Bach composed over 200 cantatas throughout his career, with the majority of them when he was dur uh, during his tenure as the Thomas Cantor in Leipzig, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, these cantatas are collections of movements. It isn't just one piece. Often you would have five, six, seven, ten, twelve shorter pieces comprising like a little mini programme, and it's a combination of texts, instrumentation, musical forms, with the music tailored to enhance and support the meaning of the biblical text. 
And Bach's cantatas often include things like recitatives, which are music... Uh, which is uh, sung speech, effectively, where the music follows the rhythms and cadences of the spoken text. Sometimes there'll be choruses for the entire choir, often quite demanding. You'd also have chorales, which are what we would think of as hymn tunes, simpler Lutheran harmony, where you could hear every word, everyone was singing um, what you might call strophically, but homophonically, but... Bach would also write arias, that is to say solo movements for voice, to allow the congregation, rather than the audience, because it's a sacred piece, the congregation to meditate effectively on the themes of the cantata. And Bach had huge, huge experience in writing this by the end of his career. He wrote, as I say, over 200, several complete cycles of cantatas, which were to be performed on Sundays. So you can imagine, over 200, that's more than four years' worth of music to be performed, unique works to be performed every Sunday for four years before he had to repeat anything. Absolutely amazing. Now, these cantatas, including, of course, Cantata 147, form a central part of Bach's compositional output and really show his skill as a composer. They show how he was able to create these deeply expressive and intricate music in a variety of forms and often under incredible deadline pressure. And I'm sure we all know what it's like to work to deadline. As someone who has broadcasts at particular times during the week, uh, it is very much the case that before I go live with something, including today, I'm literally still quickly putting things together and that pales into insignificance compared to what Bach had to do. Given that he had to actually draw the lines on the paper before he could write the notes, he had to produce the part, he had to rehearse the musicians, he had to sometimes engage the musicians and pay them and then invoice the church. Uh, it's a huge amount of work just to produce these cantatas, but we're so grateful he did because they influenced so many composers to follow in the centuries uh, afterwards. Now, let's talk a little bit here now. At this point, I'm not expecting you to be able to read what's here on screen. This is a a summary, really, of Bach's life, kind of just distilled into one block of text. And if you're watching this later on, feel free to uh, pause it, zoom in, and you can see uh, an awful lot of the information. But I'm going to very quickly skim over this uh, because there's stuff we need to talk about more urgently. But he was born, as I said, in 1685 in Eisenacht. He was an orphan by the age of 10, but he had older brothers and a huge family who made sure that he made it through to the age of 18, by which time he was already organist at the Neue Kirche, the new church in Arnstadt. So at the age of 18, he was an organist in a major city with a brand new organ that had been just uh, commission. He threw himself into the study of music. It was very clear that he was going to be an organist, much like so many others in the Bach family. And so he studied music, particularly by Buxtehude, who was a really influential musician at the time, and of course music by Packelbell, as we discussed last week. Uh, now he married Maria Bach, who was his cousin in 1707, and moved to the town of Mühlhausen, uh, where he composed many of his early works for organ, including, we think, that famous Toccata and Fugue in D minor, as well as several Capriccios and various other rather technically demanding pieces. He then moved to Weimar, where he composed most of his organ preludes and fugues, and really threw himself into the study of instrumental music. In particular, the music and concertos of Antonio Vivaldi, whose music we're very familiar with both here and on other digital choir channels. And in composing, or at least studying music by Vivaldi, what he discovered, of course, is the, uh, is the style in which one writes concertos. Just a little aside, if you know your Handel and you listen to his concerto grosso or concerti grossi, group concertos, you'll think that sounds awfully like the composer Corelli. Well, that's because Handel studied the concertos of Corelli in quite some detail. Bach studied the concertos of Vivaldi, so his concertos follow the same structures as Vivaldi's concertos. Just a little aside there. Now, uh, in Weimar, he was very successful as an organist, but he wasn't successful on a personal level. He didn't get on very well with his employer. And in fact, there are several records of him brawling with fellow musicians, even fighting a duel with a rival composer. Shortly after that, he uh, took it upon himself to negotiate rather forcefully with his employer, asking to be released from his contract. His employer refused. Bach insisted, so his employer had him imprisoned. And he was locked up for, we believe, somewhere between a month and six weeks. Now, on his release, 
he understandably changed jobs and went with his wife to the town of Curtin, where he um, produced most of his chamber and instrumental music, in particular the Brandenburg concertos, uh, the well-tempered clavier uh, and many instrumental concertos. His wife Maria died suddenly in July of 1720. Uh, a year later, he married Anna Magdalena, for whom he wrote the little notebook uh, to help her uh, learn to play the keyboard. And Bach was appointed the director of church music for the city of Leipzig in 1723. Now, this is where we are going to jump on board with Bach. There is more, of course, to talk about, uh, including the passions and so on. I'm going to have to leave that for another day because we need to talk about Bach in Leipzig. Now, he was, as I say, appointed the... Oops, excuse me. He was appointed the uh, the director of music for the city. Now, this actually meant not one, not two, but four churches for which he was required to produce music. And there were different requirements, different needs for each of these churches. Sometimes they would just sing a simple line. Other times they'd have to sing complicated instrumental parts. So Bach had to really devote himself to industry and producing large volumes of music. Now, the Cantata 147 was produced uh, for the, excuse me a second folks, I just need to restart my presentation. There we go, that's better. It was composed in 1723 for the Feast of the Visitation, which celebrates the visit of the Virgin Mary to her cousin Elizabeth. The cantata consists of 10 movements, including the famous chorale, which we know as Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. And in fact, this, this particular movement comes back twice at the end of each half of the cantatas. The libretto is written by a, a, a chap called Salomon Frank, who is a poet and librettist who Bach worked with on several other cantatas. And so the, the text is not biblical. The text is inspired by, uh, by sections of the Bible, and he would often have librettists, poets and so on, meditating, as I said earlier on, writing so that the congregation would be able to think of it as a musical sermon quite often, although, of course, there would be a, an actual sermon in the middle of the cantata. Now, the tune that Bach used for the famous chorale was actually based on a tune by this chap here with the magnificent ruff and a nose that really just keeps on going. His name is Johann Rist, and he wrote uh, this original Lutheran evening hymn called Werde munter, mein Gemutter, Become Cheerful, My Mind. Now, the hymn was translated to English, was printed in 1642, and was a very, very well-known tune. So so the tune... Which we know as Jesus Drive Man's Desiring was not Bach's original. It was based on the tune by this chap. But of course the harmonisation and that wonderful interweaving line and everything else is all JSB. So the music of Cantata 147, which was performed for the very first time on July the 2nd, in 1723, almost exactly 300 years to the day that we're recording this lecture, uh, really does showcase Bach's rich and varied musical texture and his expert use of counterpoint and harmony, but also his expert uh, expertise in writing for instruments. As we'll hear shortly, not only will we have the traditional Baroque accompaniment of violins and violas, cellos, there'll be uh, organ continuo, but he also employs solo instruments and these are very carefully chosen. There's nothing random about this instrumental choice. When he uses trumpets, quite often it's to provide a joyous and triumphant sound, but he also uses instruments like the oboe di caccia, uh, and he also writes for solo violin, and all of these instruments are chosen to reflect the emotion of the text, and in some, many cases to enhance and, uh, and delight the, uh, the, the sound. So let's have a little look at uh, the church itself. This is St Thomas's Leipzig. It's very likely, in fact, that the first performance took, right, uh, took place right down there at the end of the church, with Bach himself directing, uh, probably either from the organ console uh, or uh, leading from the first desk. And uh, Bach himself would have, uh, would have taken quite a lot of the performance opportunities, particularly if they were keyboard-related. And we'll hear a bit later on. There's one movement where 
I think it's pretty clear from the way it was written that Bach was actually at the organ. Now, we can see here the concerto, concerto, sorry, the cantata itself is in 10 movements, and the first six movements form the first part of the cantata. It would have been uh, interspersed with readings from the Bible, with prayers and so on. But after the sixth movement, Vol mir das ich je habe, which is... Uh, the, the movement that we derive, Jesus drove man desiring, there would have been a sermon and then some more prayers and then the rest of the movements to follow with the last movement, Jesus bleib at meiner Freude, again, the Jesus drove man desiring to finish off the service. So here is a page from the actual score and you can have a look for this yourself if you uh, Google, if you put, look up Bach, uh, Herz und Mund, and then if you go to IMSLP, which is uh, this wonderful website, which uh, has put so many scores up there in the public domain, you can actually browse through Bach's original score. It's an incredible, incredible experience. And we can see here that Bach is writing for a large ensemble. He's relatively large. Uh, you have the string parts, you have the instrumental uh, continuo, but you also have a solo trumpet line. Now this of course is a baroque trumpet, uh, no valves here, none of those little buttons to press, uh, just simply holes and a long length of pipe. Really very, very demanding instrument to play. It's very clear that Bach knew some fantastic trumpeters. And the first movement is bright and joyful, as you would expect for the Feast of the Visitation. You'll hear the choir coming in, oddly enough, for Bach in a fugue. And a fugue is a com complex, compl uh, con can't speak today, complex contrapuntal form. I should put my teeth in. Uh, which is characterised by the systemic entry of individual lines coming in one after the other. Not at the same pitch, but at complementary pitches. It's a really, really very difficult form in which to write. I remember being taught it, or at least someone taught at me. I, I'm not sure I took it all in, because frankly it's extraordinarily difficult to write fugues. But it is effectively writing, composing a musical tapestry. And in this case, the first line to come in is the soprano line, followed by the altos, then the tenors and the basses. So you get a sense of progression with each part entering. And then you hear these typical, really intricate interweaving lines. Very, very difficult to perform. So it's very clear again that Bach's musicians, his singers, were working at the top of their game. Let's have a little bit of this first movement. Herz und Mund und Tat und Leben. Absolutely glorious music. And as I said, the complete cantata is available in the description of today's video and it is conducted by Nikolaus Haunenkort, an incredible, incredible uh, Baroque specialist. So that first movement you can hear is bright, it's joyous, it has a little bit of the feel of those Brandenburg concertos which Bach had already written at this point of his, in his career. Uh, I, I, it was actually designed to be a job interview for a job he didn't actually get and the person he sent 
the scores of the Brandenburg Concertos too, just put them in a cupboard where they languished for centuries. But it's very clear that the impact of writing that music was still there on Bach. Now, what happens after that is we have a recitative. And you can see here a little bit of the score. You can see it's written very sparsely. Um, that's because the important line here is the message that the tenor soloist sings. Geben deiter Mund, which is blessed mouth. Mary makes the innermost part of her soul known through thanks and praise. With herself, she begins to tell of the wonders of the Saviour, all that he has done for her as his handmaid. So this restative follows the more flexible rhythm that you get with a restative. It follows the natural speech inflections of the German text. And harmonically, it moves quickly through various keys to reflect the changing emotions of the text. And you've got to bear in mind that for some composers, they didn't do this to anywhere near the sort of extremes that Bach does. Although Bach never wrote an opera, there is something very operatic, something very human, something hugely emotional about his recitatives. Let's have a little bit of Ian Bostridge singing this wonderful recit. Dank und Rühmen kurz. Sie fängt bei sich an, des Heilands Wunder zu erzählen, was er an ihr als seine Macht getan. Lovely stuff. As I say, you can hear the chords shifting underneath as the emotional content of the music progresses, and that's a real hallmark of Bach's cantatas. Now, what follows, having brought us to this place emotionally, is a beautiful alto aria, which is in what's called da capo form. Da capo is in the head, and what happens is, is that you have an A section, a first section, you have a B section which contrasts, and then da capo, you go back to the beginning and you play that first section again, often with some additional ornaments, some decorations, some trills, some mordants, some turns, some additional little notes that are often entirely down to the performer, but always within some strict conventions. Uh, and we can see here a beautiful violin line that's been written in. It's called an obligato. That is an instrument that must be included. You can't leave it out. And um, it's uh, this one is called Scherme dich, o Seele nicht. Do not be ashamed, O soul, to acknowledge your saviour. And here, Bach is really taking the emotional content very, very seriously. The trumpet is, is nowhere to be heard here. The violin really does, well, tug at the heartstrings. Let's have a little bit of this lovely alto aria. This is obviously not a violin. This is no Bodomori, everyone. So, as I say, an oboe de mori, which is a lower-pitched oboe and um, has a beautiful, very, very sonorous and very alto-like sound. And you can hear um, that we are in a three-time, a one, two, three, one, which gives it, again, a more heartfelt and lyrical sound. 
Now then is uh, we have a bass recitative and quite often, and those of you that are familiar with Baroque music, you know that the basses are not often used for deeply mournful, sorrowful, lyrical passages. They're often used for drama and this is no exception. You have a bass recitative again, mirroring that, those speech patterns and rapid harmonic motion. Uh, and Bach often uses these recitatives to sort of propel the narrative or the theological message of the cantata. Uh, the, the theme of this one, stubbornness can blind the powerful until the arm of the highest thrusts them from their seat. And let's see if you can spot the subtle way in which Bach illustrates this drama. Here we go. <laughs> Gewaltige Verblenden, bis sie des Fürsten Arm vom Stuhle stößt. Doch dieser Arme Yet this arm, even though the round earth trembles before it, listen to the trembling. There we are. Now we will be hearing from the bass later on in his other typical uh, typical role. So it's either really dramatic or it's really loud and celebrated. We'll have a little bit of that later on. Now the fifth movement is a gorgeous aria for the soprano. This is the one that has the prominent violin of the Gato line, which again, much like that third movement of the alto, just weaves in and out. It, it This is where Bach is becoming such a pioneer. He is writing so that the voice and the instrument solo are at parity with each other. It's not a case of the voice is the most important and everything else decorates, which would have been more of the case in uh, the early Baroque. Here, he is treating the voice as an instrument and the instrument as a voice. And that is, is a key aspect to this. Let's have a little bit of this beautiful, beautiful aria, um, which is called Breite dir noch itzo di Bahn. Here we go. <laughs> Being prepare the way to you now, Jesus, my Saviour. Choose the believing soul and look upon me with eyes of mercy. You can hear the entreating nature. Absolutely beautiful. And this, again, is one of the key features of Bach. We've heard already so many different emotions, so many different styles, and it's all drawn from the text. And this is something that Bach did so very well. Now we come to the, the reason that we're all here today. This famous chorale, this wonderful piece, which we know as Jesus Drove Man's Design, but actually yeah, there's two versions of it, and neither of them uh, are anything stylistically like what we think of as Jesus Drove Man's Desiring. The first time we hear it, the words are, Woll mich das ich Jesum habe, o wie feste halt ich in. What joy for me that I have Jesus. Oh, how firmly I hold on to him, so that he may make my heart rejoice when I am sick and mournful. I have Jesus who loves me and gives himself to me for his own. Ah, therefore, I shall not let go of Jesus, even if my heart should break. Much more of a personal relationship with the Saviour. Jesus Drive Man's desiring is broader. That's, that's looking at all of humanity. These are much more personal 
uh, reflections, much more personal meditations on the relationship with Christ. And so we'll, we'll get to this shortly. But when you listen to this, think about when you've previously sung Jesus Joy, particularly uh, not here on the channel. Think about it. Often when we sing Jesus Who Joy of Man's Desiring, it's slower, much slower. When you heard it played on the piano, it's substantially slower. This time it's dance-like, it's flowing because it's much more of an intricate, intimate, personal relationship with Christ. So let's have a little bit of this. This would have ended the first part of the cantata. heart rejoice when I am sick and mournful so you can hear already it's a different piece to the one that we know to the one that we're so familiar with and actually it makes much more sense now there would have been a sermon at this point before a, uh, a beautiful oddly enough, light and rather wholesome aria sung by the tenor soloist. And if you can just see, appreciate it, it's quite small here on screen, um, but you can see a very intricate bass line. And actually what this is, is the cellos playing uh, eighth notes, playing quavers, and the faster intricate notes are being filled in by the organ. And this would have created, well, it does create a wonderful, um, very, very intricate texture. And this is why I pr I'm pretty sure that Bach would have led this from the organ um, because of obviously he was a legendary organist. Now, the music is called Hilf Jesu Hilf and translates as Help Me Jesus so that I may confess you in good fortune and misfortune, joy and sorrow. So it is a cry for help, but it is a positive cry for help. And uh, I think you'll enjoy this. Here's a little bit, just a touch of Hilf Jesu Hilf. <laughs> So just listen to this line with the organ here. So cello punctuating. Dun, 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 dun. So beautiful, so incredibly carefully written. And just think he, he would often just write this straight out. I, I do tell the legend that he would be frequently seen stumbling from his study late at night, fingers covered with ink, crying because the music he'd written was so beautiful and he always attributed it to his creator, never took it for himself. Now there is another recitative here called De Höchsten Almach Wunderhand, the mirac miraculous hand of the Almighty works in the secret places of the earth. And this is a beautiful alto recit with uh, a pair of oboe da caccia. Now we heard the, from the oboe da more earlier on, which has a sort of a, an egg-shaped bell. The oboe de catcher is slightly smaller, is pitched about a fifth lower than the modern oboe, and it translates literally as the hunting oboe. And I just love the idea of riding out on horseback to catch whichever animal it, it is you're after, carrying your hunting oboe, you know, making sure you'll read. Maybe you could just play the read. That would probably give the game away that you were hunting. Let's have a little bit 
of the Hoxton Almacht of Wunderhand. Here we go. Okay, little moment there. Did you hear the instruments jumping? The text in German, er wird bewegt, er hüpft und springet. He is moved, he leaps and jumps. So, of course, the instruments all, just very specifically and intricately, responding to Bach's melodic lines. What a genius. And remember, he was having to write this almost on a weekly basis. Still can't quite believe it. Now, what follows, and we're very nearly at the end of the cantata, but before the last movement, which will be very familiar, there is, as promised, a bass aria, which sounds, again, just like one of his Brandenburg concertos. It's bright, it's fanfare-like. The text, Ich will von Jesu Wunden singen, I shall sing of the wonders of Jesus and bring him to the offering of my lips, according to the covenant of his love. And, uh, well, you just hear the, the, the celebratory nature of this. Bear in mind that Bach... I know I was slightly facetious earlier on saying he doesn't really use the basses in a mournful style. Um, if you listen to the bass uh, cantata, Ich habe genug, you will absolutely hear that heartbreak. But here he is writing for the basses. So many Baroque composers did. Bright, celebratory, fanfare-like. Here is a little bit of this wonderful aria. <laughs> Absolutely marvellous and really very, very demanding. To say again, Bach's musicians were clearly the very, very best he could get. Now, this brings us to the last chorale, which is, again, uh, the, of the tune that we know as, as Jesu Drive Man Cesaring. This time, though, it's wrapping up the cantata, so thematically, Jesus bleibet meine Freude, Jesus remains my joy. Meines Herzens trost und saft, the comfort and life's blood of my heart. Jesus defends me against all sorrows. He is my life's strength. Er ist meines Lebenskraft. The delight and sun of my eyes, my soul's treasure and joy. Therefore, I shall not let Jesus go from my heart and sight. And if we consider again the text of Jesus Drive Man's Design, which we'll see in just a moment, this again is about the personal relationship of each member of the congregation with Christ, as opposed to a broader, um, a broader church approach, which is uh, is Jesu joy. So now people are asking, why, how did Jesu joy end up being taken from that cantata and turned into a standalone piece? Well, it's largely down to this lady here. This is Dame Myra Hess. Um, who was a very famous pianist. She was known as the wartime pianist. And she arranged this piece. It was published in 1926 for piano solo and then published again in 1934 for piano duet. And it's largely down to this arrangement. And I'll show you the score. In fact, here it is. Uh, this is the original score, which you can find online if you search for it. And uh, this brought it out of the cantata where it was actually written for all these different instruments. Just to hear, hear it again, it's a little bit of the instrumental version. And so on. 
but because these were all individual lines, you couldn't sit down and play it. So she arranged it for solo piano, which meant anyone with a piano could sit down and work their way through it. And this made it incredibly popular, particularly at church services and weddings, where it was performed often very, very slowly indeed. And I'm just to illustrate that, have a little listen. I recorded this earlier today, and this should sound very familiar. This is Myra Hess's arrangement. And just get a load of the tempo here. Tune is in the tenor. So it is still Bach's music. It's still Bach's music, but it's written out for solo piano. And it has much more in common, I think, stylistically with perhaps the music of Liszt or Chopin. It's a, a romanticized version of Bach. But for many of us, that is how we know it. Now that, of course, opened the door to people wanting to sing it in English. And so the words that we know, Jesus drove man's desiring, holy wisdom, love most bright, drawn by thee, our souls aspiring, soar to uncreated light. These words are attributed to the then poet laureate, Robert Bridges, and it's not a translation of Bach at all. Uh, whereas the original, as we already discovered, expressed this close, friendly and familiar relationship with Jesus, um, this is slower, more stately and much broader, applying to the whole congregation rather than the individual, which I always found is fascinating. And so when we here on Home Choir learnt and performed Jesus You Drive Man's Desiring, I couldn't help but take inspiration from Bach's original, which is why when we learned it, lots of people saying this is a bit faster than I'm familiar with. But of course, what we've got here, and we'll hear it as, as I speak, what we'll hear is closer to Bach's original intention, although the words are still um, that of uh, the Myra Hess arrangement. We're trying, I think, to recapture a little bit of that joy and that sprightliness. So here's you singing it. So really, everyone, it is an extraordinary piece of music. I would thoroughly recommend you familiarise yourself with Cantata 147. And if you enjoy it, look for different performances, different recordings of that work, which will lead you down a wonderful rabbit hole of 200 cantatas, although sadly many of them were lost to time. There are more than enough remaining, recorded by some of the world's greatest uh, greatest exponents of Bach, John Elliott Gardner being some, Nicholas Harnacor being another, and taken as a body of work, the cantatas are an astonishing collection of music. If he just produced these works on his uh, on their own, they would have been more than enough for uh, one composer's life, several composers' lives. The fact he also produced all that instrumental music, he produced the concertos, he produced the passions, he produced the mass in B minor. I mean, they, just so much music. It goes on and on and on. There is no doubt that Bach is the greatest composer who ever lived. And I think anyone, <laughs> anyone would agree. Even Mozart, Beethoven, Handel, they all they all understood the impact that Bach had on our lives. But it's not just the technical, it's also the emotional connection that he brings. The fact that he's able to, to weave these intricate lines around the simplest, most heartfelt, most wholesome ideals is why I think 
his music has stood the test of time. So thank you, JSB, even though I still have some pieces of Baroque composition outstanding from when I was 19. I found it altogether far too uh, intimidating when I was a teenager, but now I am here in my 40s, I have to acknowledge. There is no one like Bach, and his music sustains us and nourishes us. And I hope you have enjoyed today's deep dive, everyone, as I had a great time putting it together. Do have a look in the description for the full performances that I've been playing today. And do join me next week for a fantastic session, another deep dive this time. Well, we're going to be in the company of Mr. Handel, and I've called it a series of blunders because it is about the composition and first performance of Zadot the Priest, a piece we've come to know rather well here on the channel. But at the first performance, things did not go according to plan. And I'll tell you about why he wrote the piece, uh, who it was who commissioned it, the story of the actual creation of it, and yes, that fateful first performance where things did not go according to plan. But join me in the meantime, everyone, on Fun Friday and Sing Sunday. As always, it's a huge pleasure to see you, and do enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.